Thank you for inviting me. Um, I was asked to speak on gallstones and uh, gallbladder disease. And one of the things that I was thinking of was what, what has changed in primary care and secondary care relationships with regards to what is essentially an ancient disease and well recognised in both fraternities for, for, um, for referral. And that is um, the... Thanks. Uh, and that's basically that certainly in South West London, the commissioners have changed the way in which they want to do business with us as trusts. And they want to look specifically at uh, commissioning values. So I've taken as the basis of my talk the Royal College of Surgeons and the, and the uh, Association of Upper GI Surgeons commissioning uh, values for gallstones, which basically give guidelines to commissioners on how to refer patients or where to refer patients with suspected or diagnosed gallstones. Now, I've left copies of those commissioning guidelines on the back table. So if you are in involved in commissioning groups and specifically involved as a commissioner, please feel free to take one or email me uh, if you want a copy digitally. I'm happy to pass that on. But I thought that would be a useful place to start for this talk. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, <clears throat> so let's move forward. Let's look at the actual... Um, incidence over all of this disease. It's common. All of you will have seen somebody with gallstones. <coughs> and you've all known the adage, fair, fat, female, fertile, 40, flatulent, and with a family history. Okay? <coughs> so those are the groups that we're, the, the group that we're looking at. However, um, it's 24% of, of, of women and 12% are men. So there bang goes one of your Fs, the female. Okay? The prevalence increases with age. Actually, it doesn't just simply, uh, uh, it just isn't simply identified in the fertility age range in women. It actually is found outside that age range. The youngest patient I have operated on with cholesterol gallstones, not pigment gallstones, which are found in children with, with conditions such as um, uh, thalassemia and, and sickle cell disease, but cholesterol or mixed gallstones is the age of 12. And she presented with pancreatitis. No, I'm sorry, 8 and she presented with chronic cholecystitis. The, the one after that was 12, and she presented with acute pancreatitis, secondary to gallstones. So bang, perhaps, goes another F. That's the, um, the fertility side of things. Of those patients with gallstones that are diagnosed, 10 to 20% become symptomatic. That begs the question, how do we know about the other 80% if they're not symptomatic? Well, two sources. First of all, incidental ultrasound scans, but secondly, um, from post-mortem studies where they've been found in patients, but there's been no prior history. But if you have gallstones, about 20% of patients become symptomatic at some stage. Once they're symptomatic, the chance of getting biliary colic within the next year is 50%. So not terribly high when you think about it, so two attacks a year, but still when you consider the severity of the biliary colic, quite a nasty disease. I've had too many women come to me and say, my, this pain is the worst pain I've ever experienced. I'd rather go through childbirth. In fact, it feels like childbirth, only worse. How many of you have heard that phrase? Yeah? With somebody with gallstones? I've got a couple of hands. I've heard it too many times to disbelieve patients uh, anymore that it's a really nasty, severe pain. If you have symptomatic gallstones, the chance of getting a severe complication, such as pancreatitis, acute cholecystitis or jaundice, is between 1 and 2%. So therefore, it is a significant disease burden once you start to get symptoms. <clears throat> and overall, if you look at the number of cholecystectomies we do a year, it's about 40,000. 10% of those patients will also have concomitant common bile duct stones as well as gallbladder stones. And therefore, we clear about 4,000 common bile ducts of stones every year in the UK as well at ERCP. So a sig significant workload uh, up and down the country. Now, this is a really busy slide, and I'm sorry for it, but you should have copies of it in your, um, uh, in your, uh, in your programme. But essentially, what I've tried to do here is, is take out of the commissioning guidelines the groups of patients that should be referred for, um, uh, for considerate, or what you should do with groups of patients. The first is a patient in whom you suspect has biliary colic. Epigastric pain, right upper quadrant pain, often radiating to the back, lasting from minutes to hours, commonly coming on at night, about three to four hours after the evening meal, um, <clears throat> uh, and severe. 
Now, those are patients in whom you're going to su suspect biliary colic. Now, biliary colic is a, is a difficult phrase. It can mean obstruction of the gallbladder, or it can mean passage of a gallstone out of the gallbladder down the bile duct and temporary blockage of the bile duct. In the latter case, patients may say they have transient... I mean, you, you could, if you question them, you may find that they have transient jaundice as well. So in other words, they say, oh yeah, my skin did go a bit yellow, my, my urine went a little bit orange or tea-coloured. And it only, lasted for, uh, it only lasted for one pee, but that was about it. And that's a history of transient jaundice. And all of those patients should receive a liver function test and refer, be referred for ultrasonography within primary care to try and make the diagnosis. Once you've confirmed symptomatic gallstones, basically you then start to discuss, well, do they warrant referral? Are they bad enough to, 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 to warrant referral? Because ultimately, if you've got a patient with symptomatic gallstones, are they fit for laparoscopic cholecystectomy? That's the one question that, everybody's going to, uh, that, that everybody along the line is going to ask. Are their symptoms bad enough, and are they fit for laparoscopic cholecystectomy? And if they are, then obviously um, referral is indicated. The guidelines that I've set out at the back insist that patients are sent to a centre that does regular laparoscopic cholecystectomy. With all due respect to my colorectal surgeons, it's not a colorectal surgeon who does the odd lap cole on the side. It's, a, it's it basically units who do them all the time. <clears throat> if you find at any stage that they might have a common bile duct stone, in other words, their liver function tests are abnormal, or their, their bile duct is seven millimetres or greater on an ultrasound scan, or you can see an, a gallstone in the bile duct, those patients are going to need a fairly urgent referral for clearage, clearance of the bile duct as well as for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. But there is an imperative with those patients to move more quickly because of the rare incidence of ascending cholangitis, which has been known to kill patients fairly rapidly in, the fulminant, in, in fulminant disease. Uh, <clears throat> and these are patients who should be sent, first of all, for ERCP to an ERCP <coughs> unit, and then on to a, a surgeon for a removal of the gallbladder. Patients who you know have come back to you, perhaps from hospitals who've had bouts of acute pancreatitis, should also be referred on uh, for cholecystectomy, again, to a service that does them regularly. These are patients who may well have adhesions, secondary to the inflammatory process, and may take a little longer to do. If, you know, if, if you've got patients with gallstones and jaundice, again, the imperative is, how, is, this, there, is this a common bile duct stone, and to get the common bile duct stone out first. Now, what the, the, the guidelines uh, I've given you at the back don't actually add in is the, 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 the uh, guidelines for referral uh, for acute cholecystitis uh, in any great, in, in, to any great extent. There is a move now within gallstone surgery to try and do an index cholecystectomy, opera uh, sorry, a cholecystectomy operation on the index admission where at all possible. So if somebody is admitted as an emergency with acute biliary colic or acute cholecystitis or acute pancreatitis um, at, the f uh, at the institution where I work, the three of us who do upper GI uh, and HPB work will offer that patient, if, it is, if they are suitable, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy on the index admission. In other words, it gets rid of their disease in one go. So therefore, you have to bear in mind in commissioning gall gallbladder and gallstone disease surgery, is the, is the facility that you're referring to doing regular emergency laparoscopic cholecystectomies? And the, um, and the guidelines will give you audit guidelines for what to ask for from those you're commissioning services for in order to ensure that they're doing that. And I would say that this is now becoming a prerequisite for referral for cholecystectomy. Do, does your service offer an acute gallbladder service and, and does it audit it appropriately and regularly? Now, I've, I've put that in a, an, in a flow chart. Again, you'll find that in the document. But essentially, this flow chart sends one thing, really more than anything else. That if a patient doesn't have evidence of acute gallbladder disease, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, or cholangitis, does not have evidence of bile duct stones, dilated bile duct, LFT, LFTs, uh, abnormal, or, or a, an overt stone on ultrasound scan, if the patient doesn't have symptoms to suggest biliary colic, but you find gallstones on an ultrasound scan, you do nothing. If patients are asymptomatic with gallbladder stones, they do not require surgery. 
80% of your patients may well fall into that bracket. It's just that you don't know about the, the large cohort of them. Why do you do nothing? Because you only treat gallbladder stones for their symptoms. Once the, the, the cholecystectomy is done, there should be no further ongoing symptoms uh, associated with the operation. Occasionally, patients may get uh, loose stool or, 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 or diarrhoea following the operation, rarely. But essentially, you're putting them through an operation that has its own morbidity and mortality, very, very small mortality, to get them back to no pain. So they start with pain, you put them through uh, an operation to get them to no pain. If they start with no pain, you're putting them through an operation and all the, more, the risk of morbidity and mortality to get them to <coughs> no pain. So there is no indication for an operation in patients who have asymptomatic gallstones. But this just simply says if, you're, if you find a patient with acute gallstone symptoms, they need an emergency hospital referral. If there's evidence of a bile duct stone, they need a hospital referral, and if they're overtly jaundiced, that ought, should, ought to be urgent, or even as an emergency. Okay? Always please, refer, please send the whole ultrasound referral form, the whole ultrasound report, with the referral. We need to know the thickness of the gallbladder wall, uh, we need to know there are stones, and we need to know the diameter of the common bile duct. And those are three things that we take into account when it comes to the difficulty of surgery in consenting patients. If they have biliary colic, refer them up uh, electively, consider putting them on a low-fat diet. Fats within the diet stimulate the contraction of the gallbladder by the release of cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin is released by cells in the wall of the duodenum, and that travels in the blood. It's a small polypeptide. It acts on the pancreas, but is also contractile to the gallbladder. That reflex can stimulate pain if there's a stone blocking the, bile, uh, blocking the gallbladder by raising pressure within the gallbladder, and that pressure then generates pain. And that's the basis of colic. It's raised pressure within a tube. <clears throat> what are we going to do with the patients once we, once, we get to those, once we get those patients? Well, first of all, if there's no evidence of a common bile duct stone, the patient is inevitably offered a laparoscopic cholecystectomy if they're fit for surgery. If there's evidence of a common bile duct stone, either dilation on the ultrasound or deranged liver function test, or a history of jaundice, they're going to be investigated further to confirm the presence of the stone. Small stones may pass spontaneously, and you submit patients to ERCP once you've confirmed the stone is still there on MRCP. If the stone is still there on MRCP, they get an ERCP, and then on for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy thereafter. There are very few indications for doing nothing further after clearing a common bile duct of stones. Only the very elderly, in whom the presentation is biliary colic, may not get a laparoscopic cholecystectomy after clearing the bile duct of stones. That may be the primary treatment for elderly patients. But the majority of patients will, at some stage, have their gallbladder removed, because that is the organ that makes the stones. The gallbladder concentrates bile. Its, mu its mucosa removes water from bile, and that changes the, changes the components or the constituents of bile, the relationship between phospholecithin, uh, bile pigment, and cholesterol to allow stones to precipitate out in those that are susceptible. <clears throat> that process will go on unless you remove the gallbladder. So although the stones generate the pain, the gallbladder is the stone factory and needs to be dealt with. <clears throat> and that brings me on to some wonderful common misconceptions that I've come across in my practice that you may recognise in yours, which makes me smile inwardly because, of course, we can't smile at patients when they come up with daft ideas. Um, but there are some daft ideas out there. The first thing is that you can dissolve gallstones. Now, that's a contentious uh, phrase, I, I understand, because all of you have, all of you have, have uh, recognised that ursodeoxycholic acid has been used in the past to try and dissolve gallstones. The trouble is the trials on those show that this, the, the rate of dissolving, you need to be on it for at least 18 months to two years to dissolve anything like any... Uh, to, 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 uh, to, to achieve any success, and the problem is you haven't taken away the gallbladder, and the gallbladder is the stone factory. Whatever method of removing stones from the gallbladder that don't, doesn't remove the gallbladder itself, the stones are inevitably black in 80% of patients within 18 months. <clears throat> the other thing is that uh, you can shatter the stones. Uh, you can break them up and let them pass. 
in London, there, were, uh, there was only one lithotripsy unit for gallstones. Um, there was another one up north in Sheffield. The one in London is at St. Thomas's. It only shatters pancreatic duct stones these days. The shattering of gallstones has now been, uh, is now an obsolete procedure for two reasons. One, Patients need to be on ursodeoxycholic acid for two years. Two, when you break up the, the fragments and the shards, they pass and cause pain. Three, you haven't taken away the gallbladder factory, the gallstone factory. So shattering of gallstones <coughs> these days, usually co previously combined with ursodeoxycholic acid, is a non-starter. Um, <coughs> you can squeeze out gallstones. Dr. Google says that you can use olive oil and lemon juice to rid yourself of gallstones. <laughs> Great, I'm glad you laughed. Okay, well, let's, move, let's move, move away from that one. And the commonest question, I, one of the commonest questions I get asked <clears throat> when I suggest that the gallbladder is removed, well, can't you just take the stones away? The answer to that is, yes, I can take the stones away, but the problem is they'll all be back. And it'll be worse because we now have a non-functioning gallbladder. Once you open the gallbladder, stitch it up again, the scar tissue makes it non-functional, and therefore the chance of the gallstones coming back go up. So you have to remove the gallstone factory. Basically, <clears throat> and the other thing is that you can do a, use a laser to use any of the above. Okay, in these days of laparoscopic surgery, that's become synonymous with laser surgery. It's not. Basically, it's, it's general surgery through small holes. It's big operations through small incisions. We, no long, we, we used a laser for about two years at the start of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, found we got too many common bile duct injuries and threw the laser uh, and put the laser in the corridor and went back to using conventional methods of electrosurgery principally. Um, <clears throat> so we don't use a laser anymore. But essentially, the message that I'm trying to get over here, uh, and I'm sorry if it's come across as a bit heavy-handed, is that anything that doesn't remove the gallbladder is obsolete in terms of treating gallbladder stones. There are some controversies in this subject. Um, one is surgical. What's the place of doing an x-ray of the bile duct during the operation? Well, we've, <clears throat> we've debated this um, for at least 50 or 60 years. And the movement, the, the, the reason for doing a, a cholangiogram during the operation is to find out whether there is a stone in the common bile duct and to determine if you have normal anatomy. If the gallbladder is difficult, what, with a gallbladder operation, there are, what you want to do is identify the cystic duct, the duct into the gallbladder, as separate from the common bile duct. Because the first you want to clip and divide, and the second you want to leave alone. And if you clip and divide the second, that's at least £50,000 down the tube from your MDU subscription. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, cholangiograms have been, have been uh, used to identify anatomy in difficult gallbladders where appropriate. However, the problem with cholangiography, if you don't know what you're putting your cholangiogram catheter into, you may have opened the common bile duct to do the cholangiogram in the first place, which you've then got to deal with. Secondly, there is now a move much more towards pre-operative diagnosis of common bile duct stones. So I have a policy, and we have a policy, the three of us who work together, is that we will not let a patient go into an operation unless we know that the common bile duct is clear of stones. And therefore our need to do cholangiograms has gone right down. And we only do them in situations where we, are abs where we think we've got abnormal anatomy aberrant ducts, ducts of Lushka, uh, um, uh, 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 sort of trifurcations of the, uh, 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 of the bile duct, uh, long cystic ducts that we can't identify from the common bile duct, that sort of thing. So that's controversy number one. Controversy number two is the acute cholecystectomy. And as I said, there is now a move much more towards offering acute gallbladder operations. Now, you've probably heard that cholecystitis needs to settle down and then be operated on again, operated on to remove the gallbladder at six to eight weeks following the surgery. That is conventional historical teaching, and it still stands, um, <clears throat> because it's sensible. If you do it before that time, there are lots of adhesions, in the, but the adhesions are, s are stronger than the softer surrounding uh, soft tissues, and therefore common bile duct injury is much higher before the uh, six-week period. However, in acute gallbladder surgery, there is a window of about five days from the start of symptoms in which that does not apply. And if you can get that window of five days on acute cholecystitis, then you may be able to operation, offer a patient an operation on their index of mission and get it all out of the way in one, day, in one go. 
There is an increased risk of intraoperative sepsis following the operation, abscess formation, and there is an increased in incidence of intraoperative duodenal injury with that, with that technique. But surgical fertility is moving very much in that direction. So if you are commissioners, ask those you're commissioning from, do you have a good track record with acute gallbladder surgery? And then finally, this, the, the operation that you may have heard of, which has actually come into fashion and moved out of fashion fairly rapidly over the past three years, and that sing whoops, I'm sorry, that single incision cholecystectomy. Now, we looked into doing single incision cholecystectomy and went for training for this, and our, uh, our uh, operational board uh, turned us down flat when we put in a... Uh, in a uh, in, in an application to, to, to do a new, uh, to introduce a new technique to our hospital. And the, the, the nice guidelines are basically quoted back at us. It said, since the main potential advantage for this procedure is cosmetic, i.e. cosmetic alone, the committee feel that good evidence on safety was particularly important and this was currently inadequate. They therefore recommend that single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy should only be used with special arrangements for consent and for audit or research. So our hospital basically said, we're not doing it. It's only for cosmetic reasons. You're faster with the conventional laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and that makes us money. Uh, but there we are. <clears throat> but if you are thinking of commissioning single incision laparoscopic cholecystectomy, it has to be on the basis of uh, adequate safety data and audit and research built into it. Again, just advice for commissioners on that respect. Uh, my suspicion is that this will go the way of other novel operations fairly quickly and disappear over the next five to ten years. Outcomes that you need to look for when commissioning these services? Well, a readmission rate within a month of less than 10%, a conversion to open cholecystectomy rate of 5%, and I'm pleased to say that we are where we are it's less than 2%, a resurgery rate of 5%. In other words, if a patient comes back into hospital, do you need to re-laparoscope them or open them for bile leak? Uh, and that is an instance of less than 5%. A bile duct injury rate of 0%. In the medical legal world, and I do a lot of medical legal reporting, a common bile duct injury is now no longer defensible in law uh, and therefore is, would be considered as a, um, <coughs> uh, 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 as a negligent act. Day case laparoscopic cholecystectomy, over 60% should be done as day cases. At Kingston Hospital, we do them up at 82% uh, as day cases. The average nationally is 16%. It's lamentable. Um, <clears throat> Post-operative recovery, just to give you some idea as to how these patients should recover following their surgery, they should require oral analgesia for no more than five to seven days. They should be mobile within 24 hours with increasing mobility on a daily basis. They should be able to do normal, non-strenuous activity at two weeks and start strenuous activity at three weeks. If there's anything that throws that off, if there's any failure to progress, then a bile leak should be considered and the patient referred back to the hospital in which they did their operation. And I've listed there some of the red flag symptoms. Increasing pain with time rather than decreasing, worsening pain on movement and coughing, a temperature or fever, dizziness, feeling faint, short of breath, nausea, anorexia, after day one, two, abdominal distension. All of those are red flag signal symptoms for a bile leak and should be considered, and the patient should be referred back for reassessment uh, as an acute emergency. Failing to pass urine and failing to open bowels are rather non-specific symptoms, and these are symptoms that can be associated with complications of the surgery, such as DVT, wound infection, um, hematoma, seroma, and hernia are all post-op complications that you need to look out for. So in summary, gallstones are common in this country. Asymptomatic gallbladder stones do not require symptoms, but symptomatic gallbladder stones are almost invariably treated by a laparoscopic cholecystectomy <clears throat> unless the patient is unfit for surgery. All common bile duct stones should be treated whether symptomatic or not. The difference between common bile duct stones and gallbladder stones is that you treat asymptomatic common bile duct stones. Complications and re-emission rates should be low for those of you who are commissioning. Full recovery should be expected within three weeks. If a patient fails to progress, please refer back to the operating surgeon. I hope that's been useful. <laughs>